Hi, Muhammad. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us. I would like to thank everybody and especially Arginect for giving us a chance to give his lecture. So as Muhammad said, I am Alejandro Fuentes. I'm a computational designer in Miautix. And the topic of today is going to be procedural architecture, which is a very broad subject. But in particular, it's going to be about behavioral design applied to urbanistic designs uh, on, of something that we have called uh, interrelational uh, prototypes. So first of all, I would like to introduce ourselves and introduce to you who we are. Miautix is a digital consultant company that is based in Madrid. It was founded uh, some years ago. And we kind of uh, try to give assistance to institutions and to private equities uh, with uh, procedural tools, uh, mainly based in the field of design. We have a very strong brand, which is called Ofmiao, which is focused mainly on uh, training. We usually give training to students uh, related to universities and other kind of professional companies. And we have Miao Academics, which is our research an academical brand in which we support students and professionals and in which we um, make some research on our own. Uh, currently, we are supervising uh, several master theses, a PhD and postdoc um, theses all around Europe. So this is who we are and this is the team. We are actually a very young group of uh, architects that met while we were students. And we kind of met in a very informal way because we all shared kind of this belief that we were not being taught the way we should, that kind of we lacked instrumental tools and instrumental skills. So what started at the beginning as something like, I teach you grasshopper and you teach me dynamo, it became something much, much more. Uh, on the left side, you see Sergio del Castillo. Uh, he is my boss and he was the founder of this initiative. So most of the research that you're gonna see today is his, so the credits are his. I wanna make this clear that I'm today just the public face of the company. But throughout this process of teaching each other things and helping out each other, just as I think everybody has done with their colleagues, we found that we shared a common interest which was through representation, because through representation, we can generate, we can reinforce, we can simulate, we can explain, and we can communicate our decisions. We all shared that somehow through the representation of our intuitions and our thoughts, we could reveal relations that were there underneath, but you never saw them because you never draw them or support our decisions, or actually while you were representing something, just finding things that were intuitions of your own, but you never kind of realized them. So, and actually this is something that is not new and it's not something that we have invented. Something that you're gonna hear a lot during the course of this thought is that we don't want to be original, neither we want uh, to be authors of anything because we are completely over the authorship conception. Because actually, this way of thinking, of thinking about representation as a tool for design and for design procedures comes from science. Because actually, uh, communication is not just a platform to show the taken decision. Scientific research platforms make decisions through representation. For example, here you're seeing a picture that comes from the CERN, from the European um, Research Lab. And here you see actually an image that is representing the collision of two protons. And you could say, okay, this is the result of an investigation. We are, we, ac we are accelerating these particles and we're gonna collide them and let's see what happens. But actually this was not the objectives of the research. The objective of this research was finding the mass of the Higgs boson. But this was actually a tool. This gave them the information and gave them a kind of an overview of when these particles collide and then diminish in a lot of other subparticles, just like bosons or muons, how they behave 
and how they interact with the infrastructure and how they interact with the space that they built in order to detect. And thanks to this kind of representations, they were able to upgrade the accelerator that led to the discovery of the Higgs boson, which was a Nobel Prize some years ago, but also to help them think about new um, technologies and new uh, versions of these accelerators and these uh, uh, detectors. So just to give you a bit of context of uh, how we conceive procedural architecture or computational design, um, actually, I wanted to talk to you a bit about our process as architects and designers, because usually when we start the design, we have very clear thoughts. We know what we want to achieve. We, we know that we want to make a house and we want that it fulfills some criteria, maybe aesthetical or maybe functional, but we know that those principles are in our minds. But the geometry is the one that is constantly changing and constantly evolving, evolving and it's with the geometry with which we, sh we check whether our principles are being fulfilled or not. So computational design basically takes the idea of computation, which is we have a stream of inputs that are gonna be operated through parameters and through other kinds of operations through which we are gonna obtain an output. And these inputs can be anything. They can be geometrical inputs, as you see in this video, they can be points, or they can be streams of data from big data analysis that come from urban analysis. But what we are defining is the way that the input that we are getting, how it's relating in between each other so that it varies in the way that we control. So this is mainly a computational design and this is how we understand it. Usually we in Meautics don't like to divide the world into binary uh, options, but for the sake of the conversation and to give you a clearer overview about what's going on in the computational design world. The computational design has mainly two branches in architecture, which are the typological branch and the topological branch. This talk will be mainly about topological branch and we usually work in the topological field, but I don't wanna leave aside the typological field because it's also important. And I wanna show you some, some examples for you to understand what typology in computational design is. But actually, when we think about typology, typology, it, when we think about it in architecture, maybe we think about housing typologies. What you see beneath uh, these words is the master plan that was drawn by Cerda in the late 19th century for the expansion of Barcelona in the Eixample. And in this drawing, what we're seeing is housing typologies. But actually, in computational design, uh, typologies have, have much more to do with morphological research and with morphological interactions than with typological, like for example, high-rise typology buildings. So for the sake of understanding, I want you to think that typology in computational design equals morphology. So here you see an example of a model of Sahadid architects. Sahadid was one of the first that stood with computational design and that transform mathematics into shapes and into morphologies that led to a completely new way of understanding spaces and how we inhabited them. I think she was one of the first, I think after Fraioto in the 1970s that actually introduced mathematics and the representation of mathematics in these kind of uh, buildings. Or we see here the Mexican museum made by the New York based uh, free uh, office. And here we see a very clear example of the applications in the typological world in computational design, because we're seeing here a shape that is not regular, that is not uh, symmetric, that is not uh, anything. So basically what we are seeing here is this pattern in the facade. I want you to think about the facade. And the facade is actually um, a sort of hexagons. And these hexagons couldn't be planned in the 2D world. So for um, kind of uh, planning this hexagon, you needed computational design, not even with 3D technologies, you could achieve something like that because maybe with 3D technologies, you could maybe plan three or four, but you couldn't plan the 11,000 that Sergio Revelo, who is the Portugal based computational designer that did this design, uh, couldn't plan. Or, and as I said, we usually work in the field of topological design, but we also work in typology. This image that you see here belongs to the syllabus of one of our courses that is called the MPA. And here you can see all the typological 
uh, researches or all the topological morphologies that you can create through the Rhino Zeros platform. And also we, can, we also sort uh, research that are based in typological research here. We have a collaboration in between Meautics and the Quagga studio in the name of Alicia Ruiz Pastor. And here in this uh, quest, we were not seeking just a morphological research that was uh, pursuing an aesthetic objective. Here we were trying to make a shell that was self-tenable that was self-isolated, that could absorb energy from the sun so that it could constantly be warm or cold depending on the time of the year. So here we're not just talking about morphology, thinking about aspect or about aesthetics. We are talking about material. We are talking about energy radiation and how it's the most efficient way to absorb this radiation. And most importantly, I'm really glad to show you these pictures because actually this is our main typological uh, research, which is the first uh, Meow House, which is going to be built late this year. Now we are under construction and it's going to be our first fully best grasshopper building that we're going to build. And I hope that it's not the last. Okay, but what is topology? Topology is focused on relations and it's focused on relations among elements and their parties, how they affect in between each other and how a, vari a variable in one of the elements can affect the others. So here you have an example of a building that is in Madrid. that is built by the um, Madrid-based company Amit09, Efren and Cristina. And here you see this picture of this very beautiful garden and you see kind of this root and you see this path and you see these volumes on the background, this kind of very intriguing, very strange, very new uh, volumes. And you don't know what they're responding to, but you know that they are kind of making this background of the garden. They are, they are pointing your view to one direction. They are hiding some things. They are directing your course because actually this building was completely planned through a computational design definition that was based in an ISOVIS plugin. So basically, they were taking into consideration how the user view the patio and view the garden, sort to organize these stones in relation to one another. So the topological relation in between these volumes is necessary in order to hide the entrance or to fulfill this route that the architects wanted you as a user to fulfill. Or maybe we have this example by OMA, by the Dutch company founded by Ramp Kolhas. We have here the marvelous Seattle library that was finished in the late 2000s. And you see here these volumes, these kind of black boxes, because you know that in a library, you need to uh, kind of hide and secure the books because if you expose them to the sun, the, the pages have started to become yellowish. So they had to become, they have to organize these black boxes in order to protect the storage, which is the main objective of a library. But they, they had to organize them in a certain way. And they chose to organize them in a vertical stratification because they wanted to preserve this relation. They wanted to preserve these in-between spaces of these boxes so that they created this kind of in-between space that made this library so special and that actually made a step forward in the history of this office. But these relations that I'm talking to you about, how can they be applied to urban design? So before uh, getting into that, I wanted to introduce you a concept that we have always tried to use in all our projects and mostly in our urban projects, which is the conception of the metabolic machine. And again, this is not new. We are not seeking to be originals. The metabolic machine was actually a conception that was enunciated by Moholy Nagy in the 1920s, when after fighting with his contemporaries so hard to get over academicism, he suddenly found himself inside another aesthetical movement, which was the modern movement. And he was kind of angry and he was trying, trying like to shout to the wind that actually a building can and should be conceived as a metabolic machine, as a living being, because a building in the end is a container of flows. And how good or how bad we organize these flows, just as how good and how bad our veins organize our blood, will repercute in a better 
building. And this can be applied to the city, introducing, for example, energy. We, when we have production of energy and consumption of, of energy, taking into account all of these flows in order to design a better city, which is in the end our objective. But we have mainly based our research in three uh, different studies. The first of all, which is the space syntax, is kind of a very useful uh, for us since we are using topology because the space syntax, um, let's say proposal, thinks about the city as an abstract, as an abstract of nodes and connections. And these connections define the relations in between the nodes. The nodes can be anything. The nodes can be a monument, a building, a square, a public space, but the connections, the relations, that's what we have to define as designer, how the system will react one move, move a node. Will it affect another or not? Will it affect the surroundings or will it affect more surroundings or not? Then the new science of cities, where we took this idea that this transdisciplinary approach in the design of cities fundamental. We need energy and en energy engineering. We need sociologists, we need psychologists to create a better city. So we need kind of a framework that is able to adapt to a trans transdisciplinary approach. But last but not least, and more important to us and to the formalize, formalization of our new city is the Grand Urban Rules book that was written by uh, Lenera in, in the 2014. And through this book, we establish the relational apparatus, which is um, kind of, he made a study of different Western cities. And he was just not talking about urban regulations and how good or how bad they had performed in certain contexts. He also studied kind of these happy accidents, kind of these situations in which you're walking through a street and then you see something, you see an icon, you see a monument, you see a high rise building. And he compelled everything into this book. And those are the relational apparatus that combine uh, with this flow and this metabolic machine that we want to script and that we want to program so that we see how they behave together. Because in the end, we are arbits. What we do is to negotiate and we establish the hierarchy in between the rules and we establish which rules are more important to us and which, than others. And we need them to be computed so that we see how they interact and how they affect each other. But of course, in the end, what we want to do is to transcend the traditional master planning conception. This is a traditional master planning document. We see here that is usually a 2D document in which it's everything focused in two variables, which are the development potential of a site. How many square meters can we, beat, uh, can we uh, build in a ground floor and the usage. So basically we are making this abstract of a city on just, I don't know, eight, uses in these different colors. Is the city really so simple? Is, this, is the site and the conditions of the site really so simple? So to just get into a document like this one. So that's why we are proposing a reinform uh, master planning, who is able to take into account all of these flows, all of these stream of data that come from the uh, big data of urban analysis of transdisciplinary approach. But for that, we need a technical background, which is what I'm going to explain right now. We usually base everything that we do in Meowtix in visual coding in the Grasshopper platform. This is a platform that kind of works just as the analogy of computational design that I was talking to you before. This kind of input, procedure, um, output. At the out and the output is varying in, ca uh, in case we vary the input or we vary the parameters in which we operate. So here you see, for example, in the same garden that we saw at the beginning, how kind of our visual sp sphere variates in, in depending on in which place of the road we are. But this is kind of a virtual representation. And we are talking about building the city of the future. And for that, we need to code thinking that we need to simulate how reality behaves. Because we are not interested in virtuality. We are interested in speculation in the real world. That's why we use an, a calculation engine that has dynamic constraints. Because we want to know how a real building behaves in relation with another building. And so to mount 
all of these uh, things together, all of these relations and all of this coding, we go into the phases, which are three, because the city is in constant renewal and it doesn't make any sense just to plan something that is deterministic or that is um, static because actually the city is constantly moving. And actually what makes sense is that our design flow goes in continuity with the city's own nature. So here you see, for example, a 2D document of what we are trying to achieve. And you would say, hey, Alejandro, this looks very much like the traditional master planning document. Do you think so? Because here we are seeing more things, we are seeing some colors and those colors express relations in the site. And those colors are linked by lines because they express the correlations and the interrelations in between those parameters that define how the site is going on. And we are also talking about structure. And also we are talking about open space and how the open space is being applied to our sites. And for that, we need to develop kind of a skeleton. We need to take this concept of the space syntax. We need to define our nodes and we need to define the relations in between these nodes. And for that, we are creating what we call a gizmo. We are borrowing this word from this kind of visual uh, um, software. And we are trying to create this that is gonna be our topological base. In base of this gizmo, of this skeleton, we are gonna operate. Because in the end, what we want to define are rules because we are focused on elements, on relations among parties. But these relations have outputs and have results. And we need to develop tools in order to see what is going on, in order to see towards where we are heading, how all of these relations together are confronting in between each other. How are they fighting? How one is standing over another? So for that, we are developing this kind of geometrical sensors in order to visualize what is going on in our process. But also, as I told you, we are thinking about the city as a living being. And we are talking about a city that needs to grow or maybe needs to ungrow. But we need to plan this growth and we need to simulate this growth because we need to see that if our starting point is good enough so that when it's replicated and when it grows, it grows in a certain way and it grows good enough. That's what we want to achieve. Okay, so let's talk about behavior. Behavior was the topic of this talk. Behavior or how we in Nautics consider behavior. Behavior is how our building behaves and performs in the city's fabric. How we oppose the sun or how we block views or how we conduct the wind or how we relate in between each other or how we relate with the infrastructure that surrounded us. So this is Main, this is not just urban regulations. We are not just talking about that. We are going beyond. We are seeking more things. We are talking about monuments. We are talking about icons. We are talking about the city where we can all see each other and, what, and where we can all relate to each other. And for that, we are also introducing flow components. We are introducing energy flow from the production to the consumption because how the users consume and where they consume the energy is very important, but also mobility, how the users move in the city. How can that affect to our buildings and to our city planning? And those, but those rules are applied to the site and they are just enunciations. They are just like, I want this to happen. I want this to happen. But in order to be able to call them, we need to relate them. We need conditions to create our project. We need these relations in between these variables. So you see here a very famous picture that is also from the Lenega's book, uh, Grand Urban Rules, where we see here the three main relations with which we always talk and with, we all, with which we will always work when we talk about urban planning and when we build something in a site, which is the four space index, which means how much ground do I have and how many square meters can I build? or the ground space index, which is how much of that, of that ground floor am I occupying? Or the, uh, or the open space ratio, which means how much open space am I leaving maybe for other uses, maybe for just enjoying the outside world or maybe just for greener spaces. But we don't wanna stay there. We wanna go farther. 
because we, maybe we want to introduce porosity. Maybe we want to introduce a rule or a relations that says, hey, I am facing a square so that my ground floor has to behave in a certain way. Or maybe we are trying to create these icons that I'm talking to you so much. And maybe we, we don't need uh, or we don't want uh, isotropist uh, blocks. We, we want variation in heights. But maybe we are also talking about proximity of our entrances. Imagine that if you could code where to enter into your apartment building and you want the closest point to, to a metro station, or you're talking about visuals, what you can see from your own window, we can also program that. Or more important, you can, uh, you can program how you see, for example, the visuals that you have once you, out, once you go outside your building, because maybe, Maybe that's more important than what you think. Maybe we are not just talking about a landscape. Maybe we are talking about security. Maybe we should place the entrance of our buildings, not just in relation with the metro station that is next to us. Maybe we should plan our entrances in a way that we are able to be seen in, in between each other so that no one can go and hijack us, for example. And that security can also be applied, for example, to fire security, how long our building is and how often we need to locate a, a communication core. So this security uh, relation, building a more secure city that is able to take into account uh, criminality rates or maybe um, uh, conditions that are related with gender balance, that's very important. And that's something that we want to add because we want everything. We want to code the perfect city for the future. But again, we are talking about the site. All of these relations apply to a building, apply to a building in its context. But we want to create a city. We don't want to build just a building. So for this, we need these relations to dance. We need these relations uh, to relate in a certain way, to interrelate. And for that, we had the choreographies. And the choreographies are kind of the ponderation in which we are going to relate one relation in one site with one another. How, for example, if we make a building taller, how, uh, how that affects another side that we are relating that link. Maybe the other side has also to be higher because we want an isotropist uh, urban uh, fabric or urban tissue. Or maybe the other one has to go lower because we don't want more people to be living in, those, in that neighborhood because we don't have so many schools. So here, for example, is how do we relate, for example, with the street that we are? how wide or, or, or narrow the street are, or how can we relate in between two buildings through the street where we are. Maybe the street is wider and our buildings has to be taller or more complex because we are able to see more complexity in the buildings. Or we can also add maybe the usage. Maybe if we have more shops in one side, we don't need those other shops in another, or maybe we just want to create more shops everywhere. And again, we are not interested in virtual realities. We are interested in built reality. So for that, we have to constantly check if these volumes that we are checking and that we are relating in between each other are able to be buildable and, and are able to be conditioned and are able to have their installations. And those installations are affordable because what doesn't make any sense is to design a city that we cannot afford to build. So for that, we need to evaluate what is going on. We need to evaluate our behaviors. We need to evaluate how we are relating those behaviors and how good or how bad these ponderations are, are going in these uh, choreographies. So for that, we go back to Kolhas and we will go back to his conceptions and this conception of architecture that can be divided in scales, that can be divided in S, in M, in L and in XL scales. So we are taking the smaller and the bigger. We are taking an evaluation that is gonna be in an Excel scale, and we're taking another one in the S scale. Kind of again, going back to this scientific procedure that we were talking about in the beginning, that the double check means that you are doing things right. So for the Excel, I wanted to introduce you first a very uh, simple concept. You see here the psychrometric drawing, um, diagram that was enunciated by Olgiai in the 1950s. So we are the red point and we are being represented as our thermodynamical conditions. We see here how dry or how, how humid our ambient is or how warm or how cold we are. And we know from this diagram that we want to reach to the blue point. 
and we have certain paths and we have different paths to get to that blue point but to get to that blue point we can maybe i don't know we can uh, rely on technology so we can transform energy to reach comfort but that's not responsible we don't want that the future city where our children will live will be not responsible will be not sustainable because because that doesn't make any sense so maybe that green line is implying much more maybe when we move the red point to the blue point that has morphological implications because we need to add some strategies in order for our buildings and our cities to perform better and to reach a red point that is closer to the blue point which is our objective and this is something that we want to do with the spacemate the spacemate is our excel um, evaluation tool it was a graphic that was again enunciated by uh, alexander lerner in in the grand urban rules book and here you can we can see at the same time the floor space index the ground uh, space index the open space ratio and the building height so imagine that we have all done these three phases we have established our behaviors our relations in between behaviors our ponderation for making these choreographies and suddenly we have a result and there is and this result stands in the p point but maybe we are in a urban fabric where we are not interested in, because maybe we are building a neighborhood that is supposed to be for families and we want children to play outside. So maybe we are in mid-rise super blocks and we don't want them to live there. And we know that that's not gonna work fine. So maybe we need to move that P point to low, low rise space strip development blocks, for example. So for that, we use the SpaceMate, not as an analytical or evaluation tool, but also as a design tool. So imagine that we are in the PGS 13, which is the first scenario on your left side. And we have the first result. And we see here that we are not taking into consideration the public space, that maybe these buildings are too similar in between each other, that we are creating these views that are not suitable for what we are doing. Maybe me as a father want to see where my children are playing from my window. And maybe this solution doesn't give me that option. So you, we just move our point and we move our point to another kind of tissue and then we move it uh, on the on the middle side we move the point right and we move it a bit up because we want it to be more dense and maybe we want it to be more high because what if we want that the people that live there are able to relate with this urban fabric if we give them a more complex solution architecturally speaking they can relate to that solution for example, imagine the children that is going uh, back from school with another friend. And then he says, okay, where do you live? And then the other one says, I live in that block. I live in that tower. Ah, and where do you live? I live in the yellow tower. So they are able to relate where they live. They are able to interpret where they are living. But imagine that that solution with the blocks suddenly gives us a, a public space that is constantly being shaded. And we don't want that also because we want those children that were going back from school that once they have done their homework, they go down and they play and they play in the sun so they don't, so they don't catch a cold. So maybe we have to reformulate again and we have to take into consideration that maybe we don't have to build so high or maybe we don't have to be so dense. So then we move the point again. And in the PGS 13, you see the same solution as the ones before, just taking into consideration shading. And again, we need things that are buildable. That's our main interest. So that's why our, our tool and our coding is able, while we are designing this city, to check a typological apartment and see how this apartment works, how the accessibility is working, how the exposure of the sun, remember we are human beings and we need natural sunlight, but also privacy. Think about those children that we were talking about before. We want them to grow wood, but we want them to be better than us. We want them to have more opportunities than we did. We want them to be smarter. And for that, they need to grow, they need to educate, they need to study. So maybe the privacy in our houses are, is fundamental because maybe how private or how isolated or how quiet the, the apartment that we are designing is, the better those children can develop and the better they can grow. And again, we need to think about the installations. We need to think about technical issues because we need these apartments to be in a price range that we can afford to live. So this is 
where you see, for example, different kinds of apartment, different kinds of apartment in size of those ma massive logs that we were talking about before. And all of these solutions fulfill our criteria, but maybe that criteria have different objectives, or maybe we have more than one objective, but one is more important than the other. So maybe we are planning a house that is for a handicapped person. So for example, escalators are completely mm, absurd in this solution, but the results, that's what we are interested in after the evaluation. So what we are resulting here, we are, we are creating a visual language that is able to help us to see what we are designing, where we are designing towards where our design is growing, how our plan is growing in our minds, because maybe we think that something that we are doing, it's fine enough, but maybe it is not because maybe in the 20th steps, it, collide, it, it collapses, or maybe those arrows that we are seeing, maybe they are not giving us the solution that we want. And again, we don't want to be original. We just aim at a better city where to live. We just want to live, we, we just want to build a better city. So for that, we need to see what our players are doing. We, we need to see what the brightest minds in the world are working in this kind of platform. So here you see, for example, our players, our colleagues, you see Harvard on the right side. You see the Bartlett Casa Initiative on the left side. You see on the middle, the black one, you see the Eteha from Tsuge. But we have seen that these initiatives are, are mainly focused on the floor space index, on the kind of development potential that the site has. But they are not taking into consideration more things that we think that they are important. So that's why we are using 65% more parameters than they are doing. Because we want to go beyond, we want to design better. And for that, what is new? What do we add from them? Maybe more parameters, but what else? We are also adding this conception of action and reaction. Action is that we are establishing more behaviors and more relations. We are taking into consideration things that are beyond urban regulations. We are thinking about, for example, the water usage, which is something that you see on the left side, because drinkable water is very important and how you manage it and how that water goes in the end to the plot and to the green areas is really important. And also reaction reaction because we are not talking about the deterministic approach. We get to a first step, but then we evolve it and we change it and we complex it because we are not talking about, about we are not interested in deterministic approaches. We are interested in, in stochastic approach, approaches. We don't know how the result is gonna be. What we want is a variety of results to see where we stand, to see how the program is able to give us a result based on all of our thoughts and all of our wishes. So we are informed. So the decision that we take in the end is an informed decision. So here I present you the design space exploration platform. This is a tool that we use to create all of these graphics and that we are putting into consideration for private contractors and for other firms in architecture to use them in their competitions and to use them in their plots so that they are able to build a better city, so that they are able to be more informed. Because in the end, remember, what we want to do is to build a better city. And again, we are not interested about virtuality because in the end, what we want is to build the city. So for that, anything that comes from the DSE platform is an expo is an exportable BAM file so that you can just attach it to your email and send it to your contractor and start building the city of the future. So here you see, for example, a result of this procedure of the design space exploration. This is a proposal that we did to the town hall of Madrid in an area that is called the Abronigal. All of the graphics that you saw are based in this context. And the Abronigal is a very kind of, um, not very cool area because at the moment is the main cargo railroad uh, infrastructure in Madrid that at the beginning it was in the outskirts of the city but at the moment it's uh, completely surrounded by neighborhoods but but neighborhoods that are crowded by criminality and by social issues because actually this infrastructure is a disruption in these neighborhoods because they are not able to be joined you are not able to walk over this infrastructure. 
So eventually they will remove it. They will move it outside the city. And we want to plan a solution for here, but we cannot have an ordinary solution. We need a better solution because we need to heal this part of the city. So you have here this result. But also we have collaborated with other studios. Here you see a proposal that we did in collaboration with Arenas Basada Palacios, which is a Madrid and Viennese based firm that usually um, uh, compete in um, urban designs and, and urban projects. So this was a proposal for a private equity in the Czech Republic. So what we offered them was not a fixed result. We offered them some rules, some rules that we thought were fundamental to create a good neighborhood, but we offered them in terms of a software. We gave them this software that was tailor fit for this site and that they could change and they could introduce more variables, sociology, energy, engineering in it so that they could create a better neighborhood a more efficient neighborhood, something that works better with the people that they're going to sell eventually these houses. But more important, we are very focused to share our knowledge and to share our results. So that's why we are going to present the design space exploration tool into the European Congress late this year. But more importantly, we are very focused in the Internationale Bauausstellungen, which is the IBA 27. It's a um, European Congress that is going to take place in Germany and where we aim at presenting those, those results expanded so that we, tr we can translate this into European legislation. So we can go farther than this traditional master planning conception from this site conception, and we start designing better cities for our citizens. And in conclusion, what we want to do is transcend this model. We want to make better cities throughout this tool that is able to take into consideration more things than we are talking about before. And Moreover, what we are taking into account is that we are building a framework, a framework that is adaptable, that is able to adjust and to, to new information and to new disciplines. So this framework is open and we can add more disciplines and we can create a more complex solution. Because in the end, what we are building is this, we are building a program, urbanism, that is able to react to changes is related is, is able to react to conditions to new streams of data so what's next what are we going to do next because as i said the city is in constant change and we want to move with the city in continuity with the city's approach so for that we are introducing the ai technology into the dse platform in order to analyze the big data uh, bases to find new behaviors or to find new relations in between behaviors. So to help us to introduce more variables that we're gonna apply to our skeleton, that we're gonna apply to our gizmo to make it more complex. Because in the end, what we want is a more complex response. And again, we want to complex and we want to make these choreographies, these relations in between, in between sites more complex and more accurate. So for that, we are introducing the EMO technology, the evolutive multi-objective uh, optimization, because we need that this interponderation is better. So we have already this AI technology that is self-adaptable and that is self-organized, but we also need that these choreographies are responding with figures that are relevant. We are not talking about making an optimized city. I want to warn you here, because we are not as naive as Le Corbusier, that he thought that a more optimized city will lead to a more optimized society. Because in the end, what we want to do is to give a more complex urban formal response. This formal response where we are able to relate where we live, where we work, and not just that, because computational design has something that is very important. Through the design of computational design, you're given a certain aesthetics. And this aesthetics is very much related with how you show yourself to the world. Because again, we relate ourselves very much with this Marcel Proust uh, conception that aesthetics are ethics and ethics are moral. Because we want to treat our citizens as adults and we want them to understand why we do what we do. So if we give them a solution that has a very strong underlying logic, 
they will be able to look at those buildings and they will say, okay, I don't understand it. I don't know what you're doing here, but I understand that there is a logic. So you are making the citizen participating in the aesthetics of the, of the city. Okay, I know that I have spoken to you through the course of those, I don't know, 40, 45 minutes about a lot of things. And maybe you are just, I don't know, you have your head completely full and you think that this is too complex and you don't know where you stand now. Maybe you're excited about the things that I showed you that shows a lot about my public communication skills. But I wanted to talk to you a bit about my personal experience with computational design, because for those who are now feeling numb, I want them to feel better. And I want them to feel that not maybe not everybody can learn to code, but learning to code is a very fast uh, procedure. I started with excitement, but at, at, at the same time, I feel dumb because I wanted to do what other people would, were doing. And then I found out how good this was working and how good computational design works. But then you realize that actually you're not up to date and that you need to re-inform yourself and that you need to accept that you don't know everything and that you keep have to keep exploring, you have to keep testing and you have to keep transforming yourself just as the city that we want to live. Because in the end, this is a very fast project. I think that three years ago, I didn't know how to call. And this is very fast. And this has formed me as an architect because actually you're not learning a software. You're not learning a platform. You're learning a language. And so how you learn this language, you are learning new ways of thinking, new ways of conceiving the design workflow. Because in the end, how you talk is how you think and how you think is how you talk, remember Chomsky. So for that, we offer you our training services. We don't want to keep this knowledge for ourselves. We want you to help us to build the city of the future. So here you have a relation of everything that we know how to do and that we feel entitled and obligated to share it to you. Because in the end, what we want you is to help us to build the city of the future because we want you to go beyond. We want to foster critical thought. We want to create a platform that is aimed at critical speculation. And here you have our bibliography that you can find in our website. Because again, we are not originals. We, we don't care to be the authors of those ideas because we just want the better ideas, the best ideas from the best thinkers to build the best city in the future. And we want that city to be built with you because contemporary urbanism doesn't make any sense unless it's not scripted, unless it's not changeable because the city will be parametric or it will not be. You and I, we are now. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Alejandro. <clears throat> we will wait for questions from our audience. Well, as you can see, we, we came tonight through the course of this talk. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Okay, the first question we had is from Reem about these plugins and uh, the coding and the platform that you have. Does it work only for uh, from scratch? Let's say if we don't want to design a from scratch city, uh, or we can like uh, those destroyed from disasters or wars, or does it work also for built environment? Um, no, it works for everything. That's one of the beauties of computational design. Uh, actually, the example that I showed you in the end is very beautiful blue and red isometric. Uh, that's from a real project in a real built environment that has real urban conditions, because actually that's what's interesting. Because if you build from scratch, it is, for example, you went to the Arctic and you built a new city from scratch, you wouldn't have so many conditions. So we actually, we forced ourselves to develop the DSC tool in a urban environment and in the more complex and conflicted urban environment because we wanted to test how far we could get. Mm -hmm. The second question from Layan, do you see procedural architectural behavioral tools influencing the international building codes? Yeah, influencing, sorry, the international? Building codes? Um, we hope so. And that's why we are working so hard. I mean, uh, for example, I, I talked to you about but we, that we want to present this in the European Congress next year, but we are mainly focused in the EVA, in the IBA, because actually the idea is that the, the conclusions 
from the critical Congress of the IBA in the end have uh, repercussions in the European legislation and in the European building codes, which in the end um, affect more other countries than the EU member states. Okay, so we have here, I think it's a, com uh, a comment or question from uh, Professor Abir. Uh, you talked about the science of particles and birds as a premises for creating architecture and urban design, but where is the user and the human needs as a parameters in such methods? Behavioral uh, behavior measured in your method is the physical behavior away from the user, human behavior. Um, well, actually, the the science, or sorry, the scientific um, image that I showed you at the beginning about physical particles uh, was not so much how physical particles can influence architecture. That was completely not the point. Um, uh, what we want to say or what we wanted to defend is our precision through representation and representation as a very good tool either to make architecture or to make science. So what I was just talking about with this uh, particle explosion image was that uh, through those renderings and through uh, those images, they were able to take decisions, to take conclusions and to build new machines, but that's not applied to urbanism. And of course, we are taking into account uh, human behavior. That's why I told you that we take into consideration mobility. We take into consideration uh, energy consumption. We take into consideration secure, security. We are working very hard on that, on, on, from, on, on trying that the cities that we build through these parameters and through this exploration are secure, that you are able to go from the entrance of your building to the metro station without, without blocks, without feeling insecure. Because in the end, it's not so much about being secured or not. We, with architecture, we cannot control criminals, but we can control that you see if there is someone coming and then you go back to your building or you see um, or you feel safe, which is also very important. And that's completely related on how open or how close the space is or how tall the buildings are. So that's, that's a social issue then that's studied in, in sociology. Okay, additional point from uh, Dr. Rabir. In the, mm -hmm. age of, in the age of deregulation, uh, it seems that the urban design method you are proposing imposes more rules on people in terms of building heights, zoning, space design, etc. How can this respond to today, today calls of, uh, for the right of to the city and the regulations? Um, actually, we we don't want to impose anything, um, or our perspective is not so much through imposition. What we want is to recognize these behaviors, how how these buildings behave in 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 the plot and in the city, and how they affect the city. We want to recognize, let's say, those items in in the list. But we, we are not establishing the relationships. We are not establishing the ponderations. We, we don't say that, we, that you shouldn't build up to this height. What we are saying is that if you want to give a me image that is more related with an urban fabric or, you know, or with a urban issue, imagine if you're trying to replicate the downtown of Manhattan. For example, and then you you make this coding and you establish those parameters that you haven't touched. You you are getting to a deterministic approach because it's the first result, and then you get uh, something that looks like more like Amsterdam, and then you say, hey, I don't want this because I, I this is not the image that I wanted to create because I know that for this city to work, I need to be related with another kind of urban tissue because maybe I have another downtown next to me and I and I cannot work. As, a, as Amsterdam next to New York, for example. But we are not we are not trying to establish anything. We are not trying to get to fixed uh, things. We 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 like more this thing about relations. Let's say that um, your for example your ground floor has to have a a direct impact with the open space or with the square or with the icon that is in the public space. That's more of our approach. We have a question from Shireen. I just need to know, for instance, how different is to use this approach instead of manual basic expect, uh, expectations. I need to know, I need to experience this uh, 
practically as soon as possible. I believe in science, but this is a new era, new era of complexity in architecture. Mm -hmm. um, well, I mean, uh, just to be practical and to answer your question, uh, the first thing that you could feel is time. Uh, as I told you, for example, in this, uh, in, in at the beginning when we were talking about typology and we were talking about this uh, Mexican building, you see that there are some things that couldn't be done in with 2D technology. Or maybe they could be done, but I, I think that nobody is going to pay you 20 years of your salary to be able to draw the 11,000 hexagons. So basically, this is um, aimed at fast, as taking into consideration a lot of things that wouldn't be possible to take into consideration in a manual, let's say, analogic procedure, because here we can, we can work with uh, artificial intelligence, we can work with big data, which are things that are very difficult to control by the human mind and the human being. But um, um, what I think it's more important is that this is a really fast process. Of course, the many parameters that you take into consideration, they would lead to a more complex result, but to a slower. So when I was talking to you before about moving the point in the space um, of Lenera, but maybe if you have less parameters, when you move the point, it would take your computer, I don't know, five minutes to recomputate. But uh, maybe if you have more variables or more parameters, then it would take longer. So in the end, we are talking about computation and in computation mostly belongs to time and computational capacity. Okay, uh, eventually all the applications and the these platforms and coding uh, application plugins etc having bl plenty of uh, of them can we find them in your web website um well in we are uh, preparing the launch of the uh, dsc platform which will operate in grasshopper and rhino uh, but it will not be a plugin so to say but we mm. we most of the things that let's say that the dsc platform is let's say a joint venture of many plugins that we have created so mm -hmm. you can find us um through meowtix or through my name or through sergio del castillo in grasshopper3d.com uh, uh, where you see for example uh, the the water management uh, plugin it's something that is called warm uh, w o r m and you can, I think you can download it from there. Can can you write this in the, the chat once we complete? We have sure. a question from Dr. Abdel Mehsan. Just a mm -hmm. second. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much for a very interesting uh, lecture. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to be honest with you. I could not absorb everything, but <laughs> I, I feel clearly that you have uh, great efforts, you and your team. And I respect that. And I, I respect rationality. I respect science. Uh, but allow me to be uh, honest with you uh, about the concerns I have. Uh, um, uh, in, in the final result, in, in some of the final results, for example, the project in the Czech uh, Republic, uh, mm -hmm. where are some uh, mid-rise buildings and some high-rise buildings relatively speaking, it looked to me like a, a conventional um, outcome at the end or, or near conventional. I, I, mm -hmm. I respect your work, Jan, don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. I respect no, your work, I respect your process, I respect very much your, your thinking. But uh, uh, the final result seems to be near conventional and also uh, arbitrary in a way why this building is higher than the other buildings uh, and there is no uh, uh, gradual sense of um, uh, hierarchy of skills. It's mm -hmm. one of the major lessons that we should have learned along the history of architecture. Uh, uh, th this is one part. The other part, which is probably more serious, is uh, I, I see uh, almost um, uh, absence of the natural environment, uh, of climate. Uh, you talked about energy, but the, uh, the reflection of energy in the urban for, um, uh, environment in the uh, in architecture uh, it necessitates uh, dealing with the natural environment in in many levels and dealing with climate and the envelope of the building and here you can 
exceed Zaha Hadid, which I, whom I respect, يعني, God bless her soul, I respect tremendously. But uh, uh, in the case of Zaha Hadid, she used the, the intelligence, the mathematical uh, capabilities in, in three-dimensional uh, form-oriented uh, curves, not form responding to uh, climate, for example, to social issues, to many other things. Uh, social housing, for example, is completely absent uh, from the Hadid. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I think I said enough. I respect your work very much, but I think there are uh, a lot of serious uh, questions uh, mm -hmm. uh, with all due respect. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for your comment. If, if I'm allowed to to answer and, and I will sure. go step, step by step and I and I will try, let's say, to uh, solve or to clarify your your fears or your or your kind of let's say um, questions. Um, the image that I showed you from the project in the Czech Republic, what we did, we, we gave kind of the uh, parametric support to a studio that has a specific style and a specific way of doing things. And they were the ones that had to take into consideration what they were building and if what they were proposing in the end, if the we, we gave, sorry to say, we gave them, let's say, a matrix of responses in, in a certain variables. And then they were the ones that decided based on this software that kind of they helped us to program and they helped us to, to make a hierarchy in, in these variables where it's more important or where it's uh, not so important. But the, the aesthetic result is not something of which we are responsible because we were just consultants. So that's the way though that studio does their architecture, and it might be it may be more or less conventional, but that that was their design or their idea to win that competition. They thought that with this uh, morphological proposal, they could have won. That these buildings could have been rounded, they could have been more complex, but that's not their style, and we are not there to to impose any aesthetics into anyone. Um, uh, uh, concerning the natural environment, um, uh, we take it in, into consideration in our rules. Um, I mean, we are at the moment mostly focused into, um, let's say, social issues concerning the city, because there are already some things that we take for granted. And, and please don't, don't misunderstand me with this. But we take into consideration, for example, the ground, because we, we know that when wherever we will build, um, that ground will have a porosity material that we have that will have a a responsible water management. Again, we we were talking about sun exposure or say or shading uh, behavior. So we are constantly checking how many watts per square meter we are absorbing with our buildings. And and actually, we are, we are here talking about the city and about how the city in this volumetric. Uh, shape performs with one another, but how that building is built and how the closure or the facade of that, of that building is done. If I could design that building, then I would decide it and I would make an ecological facade and I will try that everything is porosity and, and actually I wouldn't do those shapes, I would do others concerning other morphological uh, inquiries or other morphological things. And concerning your comment uh, about Sahadid, I just gave Sahadid as an example of what um, computational design in the field of typology is. I, I respect uh, Sahadid, as you said, God bless her, and, and I respect her work uh, very much. I agree with some of her work and with some other. As you said, for example, she hasn't taken into consideration anything that is related with social issues. And that's something that I'm not uh, relate or re or I don't find relatable to. I just gave you an example of uh, in the recent history of architecture, someone that took serious these procedures, but they took them serious from a typological point of view, which is we are exploring shapes. Sorry for these very long answers. That's something very Spanish. Okay, we have question uh, about the website uh, of Miao. 
uh, regarding the materials there? Uh, is it available in English or it's only for, uh, Spanish? Um, I should check. Um, we have some websites in English. We have some websites in Spanish, but it should be in English anytime. Um, we, everything yeah. that we do, we offer it in English. Okay, I think I shared most of the websites okay. on the chat already, but I'm not sure if there is something we, we missed. Uh, uh, I think we, we, we had all the questions and okay. uh, thank you again, Alejandro. I, 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 if you can write us uh, some of the websites just to assure that we didn't miss anything, if you can just copy them to the chat. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Just make sure that you can send it to everyone when you. Yeah, I, I see everyone. Yeah, yeah. So Sergio De, uh, Del Castello and yeah, uh, grasshopper3d.com and food for rhino. Mm. Okay. Uh, and, and of course you can find more material in any of our websites, which are uh, offmeow.com uh, and meowtix.com uh, and, and you can contact us through email or through any of our social networks, and we will be very, very happy to um, answer will... you and to give us and to give you more detail about what we did in the design explore and design space exploration too. Yeah, I will just copy your Instagram and uh, Twitter here, so if anyone have questions, they can contact you there. Yeah, sure. My house that are great. Hmm? The me house org, this one. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. Okay. And the other one, computational design, house of me. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Thank you again, Alejandro, and for the team Thank in you. Mayo, and okay. for having you, all the questions. Thank you. Take care. Thank you all for attending and for your questions. They were really interesting. Thank and you. Have we a will happy keep. Sunday. Yeah, we will keep it now. Just if anyone have uh, something to copy it from the chat, the website, mm -hmm. so you can take it. Thank you. Okay. Thank have you. a good night. Take care. Night.